Hello everyone, I'm Wendell Jones and welcome to this special forum on taxation and the economy. All through the Bahamas, people are talking about taxation. As a matter of fact, it is said that it is causing some consternation in some circles in the Bahamas as the government of the Bahamas is set to increase taxes in a number of areas. In the budget address to the Parliament at the opening of the debate on the budget, the Minister of Finance, K. Peter Turnquist, said that the era of fiscal irresponsibility has come to an end. As we promised Bahamians, fiscal discipline will henceforth prevail. With this budget, he said, we have introduced a legally binding framework that obliges us to adhere to a mandated schedule of continuous deficit reduction, and that will prevent any future government from ever engaging in reckless fiscal management and excessive deficit financing. With those opening words, we introduce our panel here today who are going to speak on taxation and the economy. We have a very, very good panel here today. Uh, we have from my right, Mr. Craig Flowers, who is the president of FML Group of Companies. Mr. Gowan Bo, the CFO of Fidelity Bank. Mr. Ed, Ed, Edson Sumner, who is the CEO of the Bahamas Chamber of Commerce and the Confederation and Mr. Philip Galanis, who is the Managing Director of HLB Galanis & Co. Gentlemen, welcome to our program, and we believe that you are going to be uh, quite fruitful and educational here today. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Good to be here, Mr. Jones. Um, we uh, want to begin uh, with the gentleman uh, who sit next to me, because uh, one is from the Chamber of Commerce, and the other is uh, a well-known accountant in our country, having spent some time with one of the leading accounting firms in our country, Mr. Bo. Mr. Bo, taxation in the Bahamas is always a big deal. And um, as Bahamians do not like to pay taxes like everyone else in the world, uh, we have a government that is set now to uh, introduce uh, some taxes increase in value-added tax, and of course, uh, the web shops are being uh, taxed. What do you make of the government's efforts right now? Well, I believe the big challenge we have with taxation in the country is a lack of understanding in terms of how monies are collected and then expended. By that, what I mean is we have developed a society of entitlement that has seen what I would call the bountiful nature of the country be able to provide and not have an appreciation that from independence we have effectively been uh, spending more than we've earned each year. Mm -hmm. But most Bahamians will say to you that they are not averse to paying their fair share as long as they feel there's some value proposition in terms of what they receive for what they've paid. And I think for a very long time there's been a disconnect between the amount of monies collected and what people see as the quality of service provided. Just by way of an example, if we go back to 93, 94, <coughs> there are we were spending about 600, 700 million a year in terms of recurrent expenditure. By the time we got to the uh, point of VAT introduction, we were up to nearly 1.8, 1.9 billion, so almost a tripling. And most persons said, well, have we seen either a tripling of the quality of service a tripling of the number of services being provided, or more importantly, a tripling of the population. Mm -hmm. And with the absence of those elements, there's always been this very difficult notion of saying, why should I pay more when I'm not receiving more? Yeah. Mr. Sumner, both you and Mr. Bo, I believe, participated um, in the launch, I would say, of the 7.5 mm -hmm. uh, in our country. Uh, you served as a group of men, a coalition, I'm told, uh, that recommended uh, certain things to the government. You speak for the business community, I believe. 
How uh, is the business community right now reacting uh, to the increase in value added tax? Um, <clears throat> there's almost a singular reaction to it, right? The majority of people in the private sector business community um, weren't expecting the increase in VAT to 12%. Um, and the main challenge has been two things for us. It was the rate of the increase in the tax and also the timing for its implementation. So the main challenge now is that the government has passed the, the bill. Um, Senate has passed it a couple of nights ago. Um, and now it's a matter of deciding whether the businesses are going to be ready for its implementation on the 1st of July. There have been some, some dates that have been pushed back to the end of August and then September for the hotel sector. But um, many of them are still saying that notwithstanding that there may be a 30-day extension, that the timeline might still not be sufficient for them to get themselves fully prepared for its implementation, right? That's the general sentiment that we've been, re been hearing. But the, the thing is this, um, and I think Gowan might have alluded to it when he spoke a moment ago, right? Batman, right? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and that is that the business sector doesn't mind paying taxes necessarily if they can see the benefits of paying taxes that is accruing back to their business. Uh, they don't mind supporting the government fiscal policies and budgets if they can see that what they're supporting is also supporting their business. The challenge is that when you have, uh, when we introduced VAT back in 2015, you know, it took us a year and then a few months to implement it properly, right? At public education, we went through extensively throughout the country talking about it, had extensive discussions with governments leading up to it. Um, but it gave everyone an opportunity to get themselves prepared, get themselves ready for that uh, imminent introduction of VAT. Um, and even though it was a bitter pill to swallow, um, the majority of persons then, there's still people who are still complaining about it, mind you, but they've gotten used to the system of VAT. And it has become a very efficient system of operations in the country. So the general sentiment from the business sector is one, um, you know, 12% we didn't expect it, now we've got to adjust ourselves for it. And two, um, the implementation of this, the timing of it is just bad for a lot of businesses. Yeah. Mr. Galanis, as an accountant, perhaps you can tell us um, from your vantage point, from your perspective, what uh, can be the impact of increased taxation, value-added tax, on the overall economy? Well, I think that the most important thing to remember is that we are in a new era of reporting, financial reporting, fiscal responsibility, uh, corporate responsibility to the fiscal authorities. Back in 1989, when Mr. Paul Adderley first introduced the business license, he required then for businesses to be reviewed by accountants to, and, and the only way that accountants were able to do that, businesses with a certain threshold, and I think it was at that time half a million dollars, um, they were required at that time to really implement accounting systems that previously they did not have. They were really many, many, many businesses, uh, medium-sized businesses really were run as small shop operations, uh, mom and pop operations effectively. And so there was a level of discipline that came with the implementation of business license. Fast forward from 1989 to, 19, to 2015 with the implementation of VAT, there was an even greater pressure placed on businesses to be more responsible in their reporting, to be more attuned and uh, attentive to their financial uh, accounting systems. And so the accountants benefited certainly by assisting persons in being able to align themselves in a way to uh, be able to report to the government. But by and large, what I am finding amongst many of my clients is that one, they are shocked and appalled that there was such a rapid increase in the VAT rate from 75 to 12%, a 60% increase with no notice, with no consultation, and with very little understanding of what additional benefits will accrue to those businesses. Because even though there has been an undertaking by the government to create an ease, ease of doing business in the Bahamas, many companies are still complaining that it's taking far too long to get the necessary approvals, whether it's from immigration, the Registrar General's Office, the Labor, Labor, Labor Board, and other government entities. And so Bahamians are looking at, looking askance, really at the implementation, at the increase, at the increase of that, wondering one, whether or not they'll be able to survive and how they are going to be able to recalibrate their businesses to adjust to the increase. And secondly, whether or not they are going to see value for their money uh, that they are paying into the coffers. It's going to also 
place an enormous demand or pressure on businesses to, for, to manage their cash flow better. Because you've got to, if you are businesses of a certain level, report quarterly. And if you're at the higher level, you have to report monthly to the government. It means that your cash flow then needs to be monitored, calibrated in a way that, you can, or you, you're, that you're able to pay the tax man when the tax man cometh. Yes. Uh, one of the um, areas that uh, cause a tremendous amount of concern uh, of course, uh, we are talking about the gaming industry. Webshop yes. gaming in the Bahamas. Um, that has been uh, the point of contention uh, since the new budget. Uh, Craig Flowers, you are one of the designers of the technology uh, for webshop gaming in the Bahamas. Uh, speak about the impact of this new tax on the gaming industry. I don't know if I deserve all of those uh, remarks, <laughs> Mr. Jones, but. Uh, Certainly. I think for the game host operators, we find ourselves in a very disappointing position today after establishing such a, a good relationship with successive governments because this journey for us started with the administration of the Hubert Ingram administration. It moved into the Perry Christie administration and now here we find ourselves with the Hubert Minnis administration. For us to be in the position today where we are not called to the table to, to have a discussion about this type of increase in, 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 in increments in our structure, we find it we're, we're extremely disappointing. Like I can say now, the die has been cast primarily because of the fact that it is now law that we must pay these fees. There are very few options that we have. I think the position for us, there's no more need for us to make arguments to fight the government. Uh, we have very little options. We can go down the road, which we've been before, in a legal term, to, 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 to tie these matters up in court, or we can do one of the others. That is, trim down, streamline our businesses, and wait to feel the true impact as it relates to the customer's performance here. Because at the end of the day, this whole, this whole industry is going to depend on what impact does this really have on the customers? The industry is driven by the customers. That is the engine of our gaming industry. The other approach which we may choose to take would be to bring back funds that we would have had outside, inject it into our business at this intersection, and hold the staff and, 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 and your entire operations. And that's one decision which FML had chosen to do. And then we even see what impact this would have. Because at the end of the day, we all realize that the gaming industry is, is, has never been, been, been challenged like this before. Whether or not it will survive, I guess we are going to have to wait and see. This is all relative to, to the mindset of the people that brought us here. And, and, and ultimately, uh, we the operators have to just take a wait and see position at this time. That's what I would recommend, of course, other game house operators may choose to go in different directions and, 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 and certainly uh, that, that is their position on the matter. Yeah. But there's a fair in the community, and you all can jump in here, there's a fair in this community over value added tax. Um, people are fearful that um, they're not going to have uh, the uh, funds to uh, buy the goods and services uh, than, and that there would be a contraction in the overall economy, that there would be layoffs and business closures, that type of thing. So you all can uh, inform us on this. I think the, what has is, what is not um, been used to the advantage of the government is really a demonstration of what analysis they've performed. Mm. If we go back to 2015 when it was implemented, we're going into 2013 and 14. Um, the government of the day similarly was arrogant, I would use that term, in, in the sense of saying this is what we are about to do. There was a chorus line that said, well, have you appropriately analyzed it? And there was a maturity that said, well, um, we will give you the time and opportunity being the private sector to go about and do so, and it was funded to do so. That report and that analysis is still available to the government of the day today, uh, but what that was able to do was look at the actual elements to GDP that were being projected. So <clears throat> what was it going to do in real terms to GDP in terms of the cost of living increases, 
So everyone assumed it would be 7.5% because that was the VAT rate, but it actually was projected out at 45 and I think that that was about what was observed in terms of the consumer price index in the first year and a half. In fact, it was lower, closer to 4. Um, it also allowed you to have an understanding over the time frame that, if you will, this um, acceleration of the cost of living was going to last. Mm. And it allowed persons, not what I would call um, comfort, but it at least allowed them the ability to, say, digest and then see if it plays out. Mm. In this particular exercise, and even to this day, uh, you know, I take the position that it had government um, presented the appropriate analysis, person's reactions would not be as um, emotive mm. as you would have found. Mm. And in reality, there is this continuing concern, and which, which is more critical, the lack of confidence that these um, initiatives will achieve the objective. Yeah. And if, and I think those two elements compounded. One, uncertainty as to what is it projected to do to my cost of living and my buying yeah. power. Yeah. And secondly, is it going to achieve the objective for which it was announced to be put in place? If there is not confidence in that, it becomes somewhat self-prophesying because what people will do is, as you said, their natural reaction is going to be, before I even understand the impact, I'm going to pull back because I'm not sure that I can buy everything. I'm not sure I can do the same thing. So it's not too late. I think government has a responsibility. Not only would it be to their benefit, but I believe a responsibility to demonstrate to the community that this was analyzed not on the back of an envelope, but analyzed in an actual economic study that allowed them to say, we considered 10, 12 exemptions, no exemptions, all elements, as opposed to, if you will, having a one-horse You You are questioning the model uh, or the formula for the uh, increase in value-added tax. <laughs> And it was because um, in the very beginning when we did the analysis, we had several options, including payroll tax and others that we went through. What it was found was the limited or no exemptions regime provided a qualitative advantage, which was high compliance because of simplicity. Mm -hmm. And what it allowed with a broad base was the lowest possible tax that could exist. Mm -hmm. You speak to our Caribbean brothers and sisters, persons who are, I'm going to say, dispassionately evaluating a VAT system, they were envious of the Bahamas mm -hmm. because we were able to introduce, without exemptions, uh, a low, low tax rate. And what they are saying to me still to this day is, Gowan, appreciate, as soon as you introduce the notion of exemptions, the lobbyists now emerge mm -hmm. because every sector and industry has a reason why they should be given an exemption, zero rating or otherwise. Yeah. And that is the big challenge that's going to be faced. Speak yeah. to confidence. Um, well, I, I was going to say that there's a confidence gap yeah. in this country. There's a confidence deficit for a number of reasons. Firstly, let's not forget that we are in the 10th year of a recession. We're coming out of a recession that started 10 years ago, 2008. Bahamian companies and business people are now just beginning to make the adjustments that are necessary to right-size their businesses and to be hit with a 60% increase in VAT sp speaks to, uh, particularly in the way it was man the manner in which it was done, speaks to the question of whether or not it was necessary in the circumstances. And I don't think the government has done a very good job of explaining why we had to go from 7.5% to 12%. Now, the Minister of Finance clearly articulated that we need to do this in order to get the uh, get our financial house in order. And to the reduce the deficit. Uh, reduce the deficit. But there are other ways of doing that. There's the revenue side, which a lot of oh, oh, emphasis has been placed on. And the revenue has, is intended to increase about 31% over the preceding year in the next year. There's also the expenditure side. And not a lot of talk and, and conversation is being had about the expenditure side. One would have thought that if you're looking to reduce the deficit, you'd look to decrease your expenditure. One of the things that's highlighted in this budget, and I don't think it's spoken about much, is that there's been effectively a 21% increase in expenditure from 1.8 billion last year to projected 2.2 billion in the next year. That's a 21% increase. Now, if in fact we are serious about reducing the deficit, wouldn't it be equally important, in addition to raising taxes, to look at expenditure? And I don't think that's been looked at. And so there's a confidence level that government is going to automatically spend the more, the more it collects, the more it's going to spend, without putting the, the, 
the discipline in place and are putting the structures and strictures in place to ensure that the deficit comes down as a result of uh, expenditure reduction as well. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Sumner, you know, there is a view that when you increase taxes, uh, you add a tax, for instance, uh -huh. people would probably spend less and the government might really not be able to achieve the numbers that they believe that they can achieve in terms of revenue. I think it's, it's, uh, it's reasonable for us to expect that there's going to be a reduction in the, the disposable income of the average Bahamian in the country. Um, they will have less money to spend on the same items they spent prior to J July 1, 2018. Mm -hmm. So the dollar that you had um, on the 31st or the 30th of June mm -hmm. um, is not worth the same dollar on the 1st of July because now you're, you're, um, you're being hit with an, an, an additional four points on your, your bad bill. Um, so what that means for the average Bahamian is that you either, one, have to be prepared to increase your spending to buy the same products you bought last uh, before the, the new increase came into effect, or you've got to reduce the number of things you purchase for the same dollar because you can't afford to spend more than what you spent last year. So the increase will undoubtedly have an impact on the, the disposable income and, the, well, I should say more disposable spending uh, that persons will have. And also, if you look at it on the government revenue side, while the government projects to um, collect an additional 400 or so million dollars as a result of the increase in the VAT, in the, the VAT rate, as uh, Mr. Galani said, the increase in expenditure is also increasing. Right? So I think there's going to be some 500 million dollars more in expenditure in this budget cycle than there was last year. Mm -hmm. Not that it's going to be a sustained spending habit, because I know they're trying to reduce some legacy debt, et cetera, that's on the books. But you have to consider the balance between what you're collecting in your taxes and what you're spending in, in expenditure. Um, and if that kind of spending continues, because bearing in mind that over the last year, the government has borrowed already in excess of a billion dollars, mm -hmm. right? Eight, eight to a little over two point something billion over the last, um, I think the entire last administration, but we've gone a billion dollars in the last 12 months alone. A lot of it the, the government is saying is to take care of old mm -hmm. legacy debt Dead that they didn't know existed, etc., which I have a bit of a question about. Yeah, yeah. Um, but but it is, there, there will be some impact on the spending of the average consumer in the country. Yeah, uh, uh, and to add, it to, what, to add to what Mr. Sumner just said, let's keep in mind that this budget requires an additional borrowing of $900 million. Mm -hmm. People aren't aware of that. The government talks about reducing the debt, and it's going to hopefully reduce the debt. The debt is actually going to increase by the amount, nearly the amount of the deficit, which is $237 million. And so while it's going to borrow, Seven nine hundred million is going to pay back or retire about seven hundred million dollars, therefore creating the increase of about two hundred thirty seven million in in total debt. What I said earlier about the increase in expenditure of twenty one percent going from one point eight billion to two point two billion dollars does not include the three hundred eighty one million dollars in interest payments and so that seven hundred thousand i'm sorry seven hundred million dollars in re debt retirement is going to include both the retirement of the debt and the payment of interest. That, so, so we're talking about a tremendous amount of money here now being paid, uh, being borrowed to cover expenditure. Mm -hmm. When in fact, I think what we should be looking at is reducing, reducing the, the public debt. As far as the uh, individual companies are concerned, already I've been asked by a number of companies to look at their financial statements to see how they can streamline and right size their business in order to adjust for, make adjustments for the new reality. And I'll tell you, there are going to be several negative impacts that we are going to see. First of all, there is always going to be the issue of payroll, because that's normally the most expensive expenditure. And so two things will happen. One, companies are not going to increase the pay rail, pay payroll by the amount of the increase of the VAT. That's the first, the first thing. You're not going to, you're not going to see a four percent increase in, in yeah. payrolls, payroll costs. That is the concern That's of the a average very man on, on, on the street. In that addition, not, uh, the, the wages are going to increase. In addition, not only that, some companies are looking at streamlining their, their, their staff, Absolutely. retiring, reducing their staff, terminating persons mm -hmm. in order to just break even uh, compared to where they were before. And so there's going to be a contraction, I believe, in the uh, number of persons employed. And then the other point I wanted to make is that the companies that I've spoken to have also said the first thing they're going to do, and we, no one's paid attention to this, is cut their charitable, charitable giving. Uh -huh. 
-hmm. because that's a discretionary expenditure mm -hmm. that they mm -hmm. don't have to make, which means effectively that the Red Cross and the, the Rotary and all, all the charitable organizations the that exist, the Chamber of Commerce, <laughs> they're gonna see a reduction, a contraction in the amount of money that's going to be spent there. Yeah. So it has a ripple effect on the economy and it could lead, I don't wanna be alarmist or a fear monger, but it could lead to a contraction of the economy. And if that happens, it means that the revenue the government thought it would get, it will not get. Because you start laying off people, you don't get national insurance. Uh -huh. You know, you start, you, 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 and then not only don't you get national insurance, national insurance then has to kick in to help subsidize those persons who are, who, who are, who are laid off. And so I don't think, when you talk about confidence, I don't think that the business community is sufficiently confident that the government really thought this through sufficiently. Um, I admire and I support the whole idea of being fiscally responsible. But fiscal responsibility doesn't only mean tightening or taxing more. It means having a dialogue and engaging yeah. the, the community. Yeah. Mr. Flowers, the government obviously believes that um, web shops have the ability to pay. Um, many of the cabinet ministers uh, in their uh, debate uh, said that, you know, you're still undertaxed, even though there's this sliding scale. And I don't know how they're going to determine uh, how to tax you, because you pay monthly, don't you? Yes, we do. Mm -hmm. and, and the rates in which was given to us was an annual rate. An annual uh, rate. Yes, but the thing that... So how are they going to they gonna calculate uh, what you should pay on a monthly uh, basis? We're waiting to hear from them right now. <laughs> the gaming board has yet to make any contact with us to give us any plan or layouts. But, uh, Mr. Jones, the thing that bothers me most with this process for us in gaming is that there has been no long or short-term discussions about the future of the industry. It, it, the government needs or should have sat down with us and let us make some recommendations with them in order to achieve whatever this hypothetical number is that they're seeking to have from gaming. I'm certain with, with, with dialogue we can arrive at this, this number without this dramatic impact on the industry. Uh, I'm not too sure that they gave a, a lot of consideration to this path. Simple things right now. If the government had sat down with us, a recommendation on, 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 on from us would have been, one, allow us to do business with the tourists. Right now, we are not allowed to do or interact with our business. And I think we are probably the only licensed business in the country who's not allowed to interact with a business tourist uh, in that respect. That will open up a lot of things for us. We can sit down and say, what's it, 25 million? That's not a problem, sir. Give us the ability to put our platforms in resorts around the family islands. I could put my platform right now in, in Ilutra, in Exuma, in, in, in Great Harbor Key, where people are sitting all day, all night, with nothing to do. The resorts manager will welcome it, because why? He gets a percentage of the revenue. The government can take the remainder. We can arrive at the $25 million by just discussion. That if this is what the objectives are, to raise funds. We have a tremendous amount of ideas. We created this industry. We didn't inherit it. We built it. We know where the weaknesses are and the strengths are. All we're saying is, with a little dialogue, many of these problems that we have been, that have been trusted upon us can have been circumnavigated. Uh, secondly, a simple thing. We are losing millions of dollars today in the industry because of untax, unregulated operators in the industry today. Let the government seek to put in place a very vibrant uh, uh, task force to collect its taxes to generate more revenue. Another method that we would, uh, we, we have to take into consideration the customers. These are the people, and I keep saying, the engine that drives the industry. We must find a way to, to, to complement the customers so that they can continue to participate in this industry. If not, it dies. Simple things like allowing us to put on our platform access. When you win, you could log on and go and pay your light bill, pay your water bill, pay your phone bill. All of these things are vibrant ideas that can help to sustain a more ongoing, developing building of this industry. There's been no dialogue. And I can think of a thousand other ways that we can generate or get to this number that they are alluding that is necessary to go this route. This route, it's mind-boggling to us, sir. Let's take a break here. We are talking taxation and the Bahamian economy. Uh, we take this break, we'll come right back. <laughs>